So this video is going to be a two-part video, possibly a three-part video of uh, something that I've been wanting to build to use here in the lab now for quite some time. I uh, first thought of this probably getting on for 18 months ago and I want to build myself a small anechoic test chamber, small enough to fit on the bench and uh, fit in a, a variety of uh, small sized antennas and the uh, reason I want to build this is because although uh, you know my test equipment in the lab now I'm really pleased with the way it's all put together and everything but uh, I want to try and cut down on reflections when measuring a uh, antenna for instance so you may have seen in the past few videos I started to include um, the uh, network analyzer showing the uh, VSWR of uh, the particular antennas that I'm uh, testing and uh, that's all very well and good but you may notice on the uh, screen on the network analyzer it does fluctuate a little bit and that's down to the reflections that I've got here in the lab the RF is reflecting off uh, walls and uh, other surfaces and feeding back down the uh, directional coupler and uh, I'm getting that small amount of uh, fluctuation. Now that reflection is even worse when you're trying to measure gain for instance. I've uh, now got the equipment, I've got two analyzers that can measure gain so I can use both in conjunction with each other and uh, you know come up with a uh, pretty accurate uh, measurement but uh, the reflections when I'm uh, measuring the gain are extremely worse, a lot worse than the uh, measurement of the uh, VSWR for instance and uh, what I've been doing is uh, taking the measurement six times and then taking the uh, average to get an idea of the gain of an antenna but uh, in all those six measurements that I take each one is uh, slightly different from the other. I do something similar when I'm measuring the VSWR I uh, normally take uh, three or four measurements and uh, just to get a uh, rough idea because of that small fluctuation but it's even worse when I'm measuring the uh, gain of an antenna. So this is pretty typical of the problem I've got with uh, reflections here in the lab and you can see it's uh, jumping around a little bit as it bounces off the walls and the uh, equipment that I've got here and it probably doesn't help that my lab is so small but uh, that's about as stable as I can uh, get a measurement like this on the bench and uh, just look what happens if say I reach over to the bench to uh, change something or pick something up it really goes off the scale then and that's just my arm reflecting in the same space as the uh, test setup that I've got here. So even with me sitting perfectly still you can see there how it uh, really does jump around so it's very difficult for me to get any kind of accurate measurement. So for testing an antenna then the uh, best circumstances to test under is uh, out in the open in uh, free space no obstacles for it to reflect off of but uh, that's just not uh, practical for the small microwave antennas that I design here in the lab so I want to uh, produce and make something that's going to cut down on those reflections and give me a much better accurate measurement so what we need then is a material that's going to absorb those uh, radio waves instead of reflecting them back bouncing them back back to the antenna and then feeding it back down to the directional coupler and into the network analyzer and there are some uh, materials that are well known for their exorbitant uh, properties when it comes to RF now you can really simplify this down and uh, what I've got here this is a building and uh, it's on fire there's uh, a man at the top here and uh, down at the bottom there's uh, a trampoline here and uh, what's going to happen if uh, that man jumps on the trampoline is most of his energy and force is going to re be reflected back up it's going to be a change of direction and uh, probably 90% 80% of the energy is going to be transferred into the opposite direction so he's going to come down bounce on the trampoline and then bounce straight back off again and that's the kind of reflection that uh, I want to uh, negate I want to uh, reduce that as much as possible
So to use the analogy of the man jumping off the uh, burning building again then, uh, you've probably seen this before on uh, you, you know Hollywood movies where a stunt man will jump into uh, a load of piled up cardboard boxes. So what will happen is uh, as they impact the uh, cardboard boxes here, they will start to crush but because there's so many of them on top of each other they absorb the energy of the man uh, jumping off the building so by the time that he gets to uh, this point here uh, on the pile of cardboard boxes all of that energy has been absorbed so he comes to a standstill and then get off the cardboard boxes and walk away so there's no reflection like there is with the trampoline now if you have a look online there are uh, some companies that sell small little uh, anechoic uh, chambers little test RF enclosures and uh, they are well out of my uh, price bracket they are extremely expensive we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars just for a uh, small one I even uh, found a second hand one on eBay recently and even though it was uh, quite badly damaged the uh, seller was still wanting two and a half thousand dollars for it I don't know if he sold it or not but um, it was uh, badly beaten up now you may be thinking that I'm biting off a little bit more than uh, I can chew here and that uh, you know specialist companies make these and uh, they cost thousands and thousands of pounds you know just for uh, one tile you're talking probably fifty dollars just for a basic one that uh, is just tuned for a uh, specific frequency I know some of the uh, ferrite tiles just for a small uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter uh, ferrite tile you're talking uh, probably about $30 just for one and if you think to uh, cover just a uh, modest room you're talking thousands and thousands of pounds but um, what I did I started to research when anechoic chambers first started appearing on the uh, you know the scene as it were and uh, when they were first developed and uh, it goes all the way back to uh, World War II uh, towards the end of World War II the uh, Germans with their U-boats realized that uh, you know radar was uh, so good that they could even um, detect the uh, periscope on a uh, submerged uh, submarine and especially towards the end of World War II they started producing submarines with uh, snorkels so they could uh, still run their diesel engines while submerged and what the uh, Germans tried to do to uh, you know offset the uh, radar was to paint their snorkels and periscopes with a rubber paint that contained carbon and uh, carbon is a really good material for uh, absorbing RF and that idea was taken at the end of World War II and it formed the basis of the uh, modern day stealth fighter which is uh, virtually invisible to radar because what it does it absorbs the uh, radar signal being beamed at it so it has no reflections that can be transmitted back to the uh, detection uh, dish if you will and show that uh, there's a little dot there and there's an aeroplane in the sky so if it absorbs all that RF material then uh, nothing's going to show up on the screen so it will look invisible now as far as the materials go they are pretty easy to get hold of and uh, the three materials that I've chosen to use is uh, carbon this is carbon here it's uh, very light it's the uh, same kind of carbon that's used in the manufacture of uh, carbon fiber material and uh, the second one I've got here is graphite that's a well-known material for uh, absorbing RF and uh, the third one is uh, magnetite which is uh, iron based this one is a uh, synthetic magnetite it's a lot heavier than these two and it's also uh, reactive with a uh, magnet so these two aren't reactive with a magnet but this one is so this one is going to be uh, the strongest of the uh, absorbent uh, absorbent materials and uh, then next it's the graphite and then finally the uh, carbon so what I uh, want to do is produce a laminate with all three just to uh, try and get that impact of that person hitting those cardboard boxes uh, 
I want to slow it down that much that there's no reflections uh, coming back at me and if I was just to use this uh, magnetite here because it's so high in iron I would probably get some reflections coming back off this much like you would for a uh, metal reflector on an antenna for instance but because uh, I'm using a laminate so it's going through the carbon first so sorry it's going through the graphite first then the carbon and then hitting the uh, magnetite that should be enough to absorb that uh, RF signal so there's no reflections bouncing back now although I couldn't find any uh, information about uh, you know the first anechoic chambers there are quite a few papers that have been written on uh, absorbent uh, materials and different uh, ideas for achieving that goal and uh, it probably came about by uh, a couple of uh, RF engineers at a university for instance uh, talking to the uh, technicians the lab technicians and saying you know we've got this idea to build a uh, test enclosure with no reflections and uh, we know we've got these materials here that uh, absorb the uh, RF at different levels and it was probably the technicians that uh, first came up with a working prototype of a uh, anechoic chamber and then uh, it was built on over the years that you know the uh, actual uh, shape of the uh, um, absorbers made a difference to uh, how they uh, absorb the uh, RF waves for instance and that's why you see cones like this much like uh, cones you'll see on a uh, sound anechoic chamber because sound is a wave just like uh, RF is a wave now when you have a look at the uh, manufacturers that produce the big walk-in rooms and the big uh, rooms where you can actually drive a car in for instance there's not that many people uh, making those and with good reason is uh, probably if a university for instance wants to spend some money on something like that they're not going to take a chance using uh, one of the uh, say a smaller company or a new company for instance because it's a lot of money uh, to take a risk on so they will go to the uh, big boys like Agilent and uh, each company has probably got its own secret source recipe for its uh, absorbent materials and normally it's foam that's uh, impregnated with uh, something along these lines here so when I uh, first thought of this 18 months ago I had to come up with the uh, recipe for uh, making these absorbers and uh, for instance if I use too much of the magnetite you would effectively get a uh, reflector like you would using uh, a piece of metal on uh, the back of a reflector for an antenna for instance so although it's a good absorber too much in a, a quantity it's going to turn it uh, into a reflector so the uh, actual method for mixing these and uh, the different uh, you know amounts to uh, actually use were really something that was an unknown to me so i had to come up with a way of uh, testing this to uh, come up with a recipe of my own so to find out my own recipe for the uh, absorbent material i uh, came up with the idea of making these little enclosures now this is plaster of paris mixed in with different uh, you know volume of the uh, carbon and the uh, graphite and the magnetite and what I did I uh, put a little 2.4 gigahertz transmitter in the middle and then switched it on so what these would do then is act as a uh, attenuator and I could measure the amount of power that uh, was being let out on the outside of these enclosures because I knew the uh, 2.4 gigahertz transmitter was 500 milliwatts so I could then measure that uh, you know a certain mix of the materials would attenuate that signal by about 60 percent so uh, that gave me a good testing baseline that I could use to test the uh, different mixes and different combinations of the exorbitant materials so here I'm going to recreate uh, the kind of experiment that I was doing to come up with the uh, ratios for the uh, different uh, absorbent materials so what I've got here is one of these little 2.4 gigahertz transmitters you've seen me use these before on my channel and I've got the spectrum analyzer it's just looking at the uh, 
gigahertz range so what I'm going to do is turn this on so you can see on the spectrum analyzer what the uh, pattern looks like when it's uh, at full power in uh, line of sight with the spectrum analyzer and no kind of enclosure attenuating that signal so there's the signal from this little 2.4 gigahertz uh, transmitter then so you can see that uh, in the center of the signal there's that really strong red line where most of the power is focused but uh, to each side there's also uh, two signals one either side that are just slightly weaker but they are there so what I'm going to do now is use one of the enclosures that I've saved from my original experiments to show you how you can attenuate that signal down so here I've got one of my uh, original enclosures and I made many of these uh, during my original experiments this is a uh, graphite one so it's just uh, plaster of Paris and graphite so let's see on the spectrum analyzer what the signal looks like now that I've got one of these little uh, 2.4 gigahertz transmitters inside the enclosure so as you can see the thick red line has now disappeared it's uh, still there but it's uh, incredibly weak compared to what it originally was and the uh, two signals at either side have now uh, disappeared altogether so the uh, graphite in here is doing its job of uh, absorbing that uh, RF signal but uh, this is one of my uh, early experiments as I said and uh, this uh, mixture in here is uh, probably a little bit too much it's probably too much uh, graphite in here because remember the anechoic chamber is going to be built up in uh, layers you're going to have the graphite uh, cone shape first then you're going to have the carbon and then you're going to have the uh, magnetite so I don't want the graphite uh, being such a uh, rich mix because we want to slow it down gradually and absorb it gradually because adding too much even the graphite you can easily turn this into a reflect but these early experiments were really invaluable because uh, it gave me an idea of the uh, recipe that I could come up with to create my own secret sauce but uh, as I say it was a lot of trial and error and even the uh, end result it's still going to be uh, a little bit of uh, guesswork mixed in there as well now I quickly found that using plaster of Paris as a uh, bonding agent for these materials wasn't going to work out you can probably see on my fingers here how uh, it actually degrades it's uh, pretty much like uh, holding a uh, graphite chalk for instance and also because it's so fragile you can see that this one's broken and it did actually break taking it out of the mold so I had to think about something else rather than plaster of Paris so what I moved on to next was uh, using a uh, form of epoxy and that is a uh, fiberglass resin as a uh, bonding agent to bond the materials together so using the resin as the uh, bonding and forming agent then turned out to be a lot better than the uh, plaster of Paris I also tried uh, a hard external concrete based filler as well but even that uh, it was too fragile and they were snapping off when I uh, came to remove them from the mold but uh, there's a couple of things I had to overcome uh, with the uh, resin I've got uh, 80 individual uh, molds uh, so I can fill 80 in one go but uh, I found that filling half of that doing uh, 40 in one go works out a lot better because even though this resin that I've purchased is classed as a uh, you get a long work time with this uh, I think it's 10 minutes it says in the uh, specs for the uh, stuff that I'm using but because I'm physically pouring this into each one of these molds I was finding it was turning after slightly less than five minutes it was starting to thicken up now it would probably still be okay to work on a, a normal manner making a fiberglass panel but not for pouring so I did a little bit of research and uh, it seems that if you add equal amounts of isopropanol alcohol as you do the uh, catalyst you get a little bit uh, longer work time and indeed I got uh, 15 minutes work time uh, adding the isopropanol uh, more than you know what I would normally get and uh, it did take a little bit longer to uh, set and cure but uh, it gave me a little bit of a longer work time now I did read on the forums as well that it uh, did tend to make the uh, resin a little bit brittle so it's probably not a good idea 
if you're making a uh, panel on a boat for instance but for this it's uh, worked out just fine now you may notice that this tile on the back here that the uh, cones are attached to is a little bit thinner than uh, the original uh, prototypes that I made to try and get a feel for you know the uh, mixes that I had to uh, come up with to uh, ab absorb the uh, RF if you will and uh, this is also a laminate you're probably not going to see that on the camera but there's a really really faint line running through this and that's because uh, this side is the magnetite and uh, this side is the carbon and then we've got the uh, graphite cones on the top there and I decided to reduce the thickness because uh, when I started thinking about the uh, enclosure I was going to build for this uh, with it being metal I realized I didn't need it quite so thick because if you take the uh, metal of the enclosure for instance this is a PCB here and uh, this is butted up and stuck to the uh, side of the metal wall the RF is coming in from this side so it's going to be start to absorb and break down with the cones here and then it's got to run through the uh, carbon and then the magnetite and then when it hits the uh, metal of the enclosure that's definitely going to reflect but it's got to run the gauntlet again through the uh, magnetite through the carbon and also through the uh, graphite cones there so it doesn't have to be uh, as thick as uh, I originally thought I can make it a little bit thinner because it will dissipate you'll get a uh, double hit as it runs back through the uh, gauntlet again so to speak so that uh, allowed me to reduce the thickness of these tiles down now to get the consistency and accuracy of uh, measuring out the different volumes for the different materials the uh, carbon uh, magnetite and graphite for instance i needed to do this uh, quickly because there's time constraints with the uh, resin actually turning before you uh, have chance to pour it into the uh, molds so uh, what I did instead of measuring because measuring uh, had its own set of problems you've got the magnetite that's uh, quite a dense material but the carbon and especially the graphite are extremely light it's more like uh, weighing out a uh, bag of feathers so here I've got a uh, typical uh, kitchen measuring jug it's plastic and uh, what that allows me to do is if when I've finished pouring out the mixture to clean this I uh, let it go off and then what I could do is just peel the uh, resin directly out of the uh, jug because uh, it's polyurethane so the resin didn't attach itself to this so as I say I decided to go on volume and I found that measuring uh, 500 mils of resin at a time mixing that up uh, gave me uh, you know the correct amount that I could work with before it uh, actually went off and uh, hardened so uh, 500 mils is what I uh, stick to and that's the maximum mix up in one go now uh, for the uh, carbon for instance the carbon is a 45 percent mix so it's uh, 500 mils of uh, the resin plus 250 mils of the carbon using uh, these little measuring spoons to measure out the carbon and then mix it all in then add the uh, hardener uh, to the resin and then i would start to work with it and as for the graphite i decided on a 60% uh, mixture so again 500 mils of the resin and uh, 300 uh, mills using these uh, measuring spoons of the carbon and the magnetite uh, decided on a 35% mixture for the magnetite so again 500 mils of the resin and 175 mils using these little measuring spoons so that way I was able to uh, mix up the uh, resin and get it pretty accurate across the board each time uh, repeatable and uh, I was able to do it in that time constraint that I had before the uh, mixture went off. Now the next problem that I uh, had was with the uh, tiles themselves. I bought a small silicone mould of uh, six little uh, squares but the depth of these was a little bit deeper than what I uh, needed and uh, I tried measuring out uh, you know the uh, 
uh, exact amount of the resin that I needed but it was just really really difficult to get the uh, thickness of the tiles correct so again I uh, walked away and I uh, had a think about it and uh, a couple of months later I was uh, thinking about the enclosure that I was going to use to put all this into and uh, in my head I was going over possibly getting a uh, old fridge or an old freezer something like that and uh, ripping it out and using the hinge of the door and uh, the side walls etc to make the uh, metal enclosure for all this but then I uh, had another thought and uh, something else that I've already got lying around that possibly I could utilize that and make my own enclosure so this was my uh, next idea a few months later I've got uh, these metal shelves and uh, it's hard to get it in uh, the full shot but uh, I've got several of these that I uh, purchased from Ikea but they're a little bit too uh, flimsy to use so I didn't really use them I had them stacked up in the garage but I thought I could use these and uh, possibly build the enclosure myself and uh, kind of bolt or rivet them together to make the uh, box shape but uh, also with these shelves they've got this lip on here now I can put some tape around there just to make it uh, watertight or you know resin tight so to speak and I can use this uh, just fill it with uh, half a layer of the uh, magnetite and half a layer of the carbon and that would give me one big tile already stuck down and secure inside the uh, metal enclosure itself so that was my uh, next idea of uh, how I can construct this uh, small anechoic chamber and uh, this is probably going to be uh, just about the right size this is one this is the uh, length of the uh, chamber so I just need another three uh, shelves to do the sides and the uh, top and then cut a uh, next another shelf in half and I can use that to build up the uh, ends here so it's a pretty small enclosure but it uh, should be big enough to say test two antennas one at either end here and definitely have one antenna here on its own when I'm testing the uh, VSWR or something like that so as a uh, first go at building one of these I think this is going to be you know work out a lot better I was getting a little bit carried away in my mind uh, looking at buying a second hand fridge or a large freezer uh, the project was just getting uh, bigger and bigger bigger and bigger and uh, this is going to work out just fine as a tabletop and a coat changer trait chamber and uh, as I said previously you can can buy them this small but they do cost thousands and thousands of dollars so it's definitely out of my price range and uh, again using the uh, formula uh, when I actually build the first one if it's uh, I'm still getting some slight reflections I can always go back and uh, add a little bit more of the uh, you know say carbon or the uh, graphite to bring that down a little bit but uh, definitely flooding this and having the two layers of magnetite and carbon making one big tail is going to make it a lot easier for me to build so laying the cones out then on one of these panels it gives me a rough idea of how many of these i have uh, got to make so i need to make quite a few more of these but i'm not going all the way to the edge of each panel because when i construct this as a uh, box construction the uh, sides and the top will have uh, a certain amount of overhang so probably uh, you know leaving this kind of gap around there should uh, take that into consideration so there's definitely going to be a uh, part two to this video possibly even a uh, part three i'll probably break it up part two uh, constructing the anechoic chamber and everything that uh, i'm going to put into it and then uh, possibly a part three where we uh, test the anechoic change but just to see how well it performs if we do bring all that jittering of those uh, reflections down a little bit to get more accurate measurements and in part two as well i'll uh, include some footage of uh, actually mixing up the resin and uh, how fast you've got to work with it and things you've got to overcome because uh, especially making these little cones you've got to kind of get a piece of uh, metal and jab each one before it sets as well to get rid of any uh, air bubbles because the air bubbles tend to form right at the uh, point of the cone and then 
obviously it's no good because it's uh, blunt and uh, short so that's just something else you've got to do with this mold as well so it all takes time but as I've tried to show during the video a lot of this is just down to uh, guesswork knowledge that I already know about and uh, the little bits of research that I can find on the internet so hopefully it'll turn out okay but uh, you know you never know I might have to go back to the drawing board and think of something else to uh, try and make something like this just to enhance the uh, test equipment that I've got here in the lab so if you did enjoy the video please give it a uh, thumbs up and hopefully you'll join me on the next one